Hello and welcome to the Wildcat Football Insider. I'm Lynn Thompson. This is Terry Sims. And in a football game that was filled with many action-packed plays, it boiled down to two plays, the very last two. One, a fourth down conversion, and the last, a Hail Mary that went viral. Terry Sims, that Hail Mary play played out for us. And the Cats leave Durham, North Carolina, with a 13-10 win. It did, and, and you know, people don't believe me when I tell them this, but we practice that play every day. Uh, it's something that we, we practice because we want the guys to be comfortable in that situation. We, want, we don't want them to panic, and it, it ended up working out for us. You're absolutely right. That 13-10 win is over the North Carolina Central Eagles, and the Wildcats now find themselves at 5-2 uh, and two overall in MEAC conference play and a week uh, to get ready to play the Florida Blue Florida Classic against Florida a and this coming Saturday in Camping World Stadium in Orlando. But, Coach, this was a classic defensive battle. You said it early on in the week going in that this was going to go down to the last couple of minutes. Two years ago, the exact same thing happened in O'Kelly Riddick Stadium. Elliott Miller comes off the left side, blocks a field goal, the last play of the game. The Cats leave there with a two-point win again. It, it was, and you know, it, again, it's something that we, we condition our players to do every day. Elliott did a great job then, you know, that being his freshman year and being able to make a huge play like that, it, it, I think it, it really put him in a different light, you know, with, with our fans, with his teammates. He knew he could make that play, and we knew he could make that play, so with him doing it, I think it just it made his career yeah. what it is now. Coach, you know, you talk all year long about the mantra of this team being pray together, uh, and, and there was no greater validation of that term uh, than Saturday when the Wildcats said, we pray together. No question. And, and, and you know, we were praying the whole time uh, that, that, that last uh, two minutes of that football game. And uh, they came up and they made a great play. You know, we, we had a, a little bit of a lax in coverage, and uh, they, they end up scoring, but they had a celebration penalty with, with their team leaving the sideline, and it, uh, we had a choice to take the penalty on the extra point or the kickoff. I elected to take it on the kickoff because the extra point, if they missed it, it still wouldn't do any good. We would be behind, so we took it on the kickoff. They kicked off to us. Uh, we got great field position, and it put our offense in a great uh, position to make a play at the end. Big call on Coach Sims. Let's take a look now at the highlights. 13-10, the Cats win it in Durham, North Carolina. As he'll run out towards the numbers. Kennedy and Dukeway stopping Jason Murphy. Here's it out to the right side in the end zone. One on one, and it looks to be intercepted by BCU, and he hangs on. And off sweep Jones to the left side. Good juke, still on his feet to the 30. Cuts outside and tackled from the right side of the 35-yard line. Play action by Caldwell. Throws a slant towards the far side, and it's in and out of the receiver's hand with a big hit coming out. That way they look to set up a screen. Near side tipped, and Tony Evans dropped it. Almost had an interception. Side and the the kick is off, it's blocked. Picked up by the Wildcats at the 25-yard line with Kennedy and Dukeway. BCU blocks its third field goal of the year. Snap to Caldwell. He throws to the middle. It is tipped up and incomplete right in front of his face. Deshaun Ray. Hand off to the left side of McLean. He cuts back at the middle and then is smacked hard. Marquez four. The spread out 4-2-5 here. Fakes it to Ismay. Keeps the right side the 25 at the 30 and slides with the Bethune-Cookman first down. Francis in the shadows, takes it to the 18, steps up, and gets a cannon shot with a right leg. Martin going back. He'll make an over-the-shoulder grab at the 10. He's at the 5 right now. Now back at the 10 at the 15, and takes on a defender down at the 19-yard line. Jet sweep to the far edge, and a few yards there as he'll run out towards the numbers. Kennedy and Duke with play action. Caldwell keeps to the middle, and he's clogged as the teeth of the defense for BCU. Drops him for just a yard gain. Hard count by Caldwell, gets the snap, sweep to the right side for Totten, runs into defenders, and he looks to be short. Spot looks to be about a yard short as the BCU defensive line did a great job bringing him to the ground. Steps up in the pocket, has time, throws near side, a jumping catch made by Stefan Francois inside Eagle territory to the 44. Snap to Brim, three-step drop, steps up, Jones open on the catch of the 40-yard line at the 35 and then goes out of bounds. Brim takes the snap, a twist rush, steps out to the right with daylight, he runs to the 30, cuts out to the 26, at the 25, tackled from behind, Spot looks to be good enough. 
Steps, evades it, now tosses complete to Mitchell deep in the backfield. Jukes at the 15, cuts up to the 20, at the 25, and tripped up near a first down at the 30-yard line. The spot's at the 31. And snap to him, gets this one off a low line drive. Murphy takes the 29, drops the football. Ball's loose. Still a fight for it. Cats say they have it inside the 30. BCU celebrating. And the Wildcats recover. Snap, handoff, Jones through the middle. 25, 20, 15, and tripped up with the first and goal inside the 10. The redshirt senior gets some good yardage. Snap to Williams, sprints out to the right. Akevius to the two, tucks the shoulders. He's in the glory land. Touchdown, maroon and gold. Takes the snap, fakes the jet sweep to Murphy, tries the right side of the Wildcats, stuff him. No movement there as he's backed up. Deshaun Ray immediately dropped on the right side. Three Wildcats on the tackle. Shotgun snap to Caldwell, play action, throws a slant. It's tipped and nearly picked up by the Wildcats. It falls incomplete. 20 turns around, hands it off. McLean stopped in the backfield by Tani Evans, who rushed right through there, a loss of two on the play. Now quarterback power out to the near side, tries to string it on the edge, and he's sandwiched to the 46-yard line and then swarm. Quarterback power out to the left side. Cats are ready for it. Caldwell runs into traffic down to the 35-yard line. Kennedy and Duque and Marquis Hendricks. Caldwell the snap, throws. It's tipped in, completed the line of scrimmage, batted away. Play action. He throws deep pass with a man to the right side. It's tipped and incomplete. There's going to be two flags in the play for pass interference. Here's a snap. Play action. Throws a slant and it's tipped incomplete. Batted away incomplete by Joseph Johnson. High one gets it down. Quarterback power up the middle and Devin James is there to stop him. The Wildcats pile him back. Snap to Caldwell. Play action. Rolling out to the right. Pressured. Being chased. Tosses on the run and the catch is made. Touchdown in traffic for the Eagles. Taken by Mitchell at the 38, bounces, cuts to the left at the 40. Now draws near side at the 45. Mitchell midfield, and he's still going down to the 48-yard line. Four down linemen, they rush four on a twist. Brim steps out to the left, steps up, scrambles to the left, tosses it towards the left side of the end zone. Tipped ball, still in the air, and it's caught by BCU. The Wildcats catch it. BCU wins on a Hail Mary. Go. A tipped pass. My God. I don't what believe. a blessing in Durham. I don't believe what I just saw. On the road. From the MEAC SWAC Challenge to the Celebration Bowl, everyone is competing from start to finish. A MEAC Championship is not only on the line, but so is a trip to the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Each game will count from the first to the last. With dominating offenses and powerful defenses, we leave it all on the field. And at the end of the road, only one team will be standing as the MEAC Football Champion. And we'll see you in Atlanta on December 16th. The biggest rivalry in HBCU sports is back on Saturday, November 18th. The Bethune-Cookman Wildcats and Florida A&M Rattlers return to the Camping World Stadium in Orlando for the Florida Blue Florida Classic. Be there for the 38th annual showdown, including the highly anticipated battle of the bands between the world-famous Marching Wildcats and Marching 100. Proceeds benefit scholarship programs at BCU and FAMU. Tickets are as low as $20. Get your tickets today at floridaclassic.org. In the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, success for our student athletes isn't just measured by wins and losses, points on the scoreboard, or individual stats. It's also measured by their performance in the classroom, in the community, and ultimately graduation. Our student athletes aren't just playing to win a single game, they're playing to win at life. Because games end, but life keeps on going. The MEAC, educating student athletes for the game of life. Welcome back to the BCU Wildcat Football Insider. Lynn Thompson here with Terry Sims. We're talking about the big 13-10 win that the Cats enjoyed, virtue of a basically a Hail Mary reception at the end of the football game. Kevon Mitchell comes up with the big catch. The Cats get on a plane. We come back here to Daytona Beach celebrating the 13 win, a 13-10 win over the Eagles in Durham, North Carolina. Coach, we start this football game off uh, in freezing conditions. Uh, it, <laughs> it was it was freezing. It was cold, and, and you know, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, that Friday night we had a fire alarm in the hotel, so yes. we were leaving dinner, headed to meetings. Most of the guys in shorts and t-shirts, and they evacuated the hotel, and 
we had to stand outside for 40 minutes in the freezing yeah. cold. And, and of course, people wanted to know who pulled the fire alarm, but it was, it was legitimate. It was, it was. You know, we were joking around with the guys saying someone from Central did it, but uh, it, it was legit. Well, there was a big we wedding going on also in the hotel, and, uh, and uh, as mad as you might have been, uh, the wedding party was even mad. I, I think they were a little bit more upset than we were because it, it stopped the whole wedding midstream. Well, uh, at least they got married, though, I'm sure, and we got the victory. Correct. Now, let's talk about the football game because this was a football game that both coaches said was going to go down to the last quarter. And uh, you said it. Uh, Jerry Mack from North Carolina Central said it because the teams were that evenly matched. Two stellar football programs going at each other, and you knew uh, these teams know each other intimately. And and as a result, uh, the first half action was prescribed to be knockdown, drag out, and uh, both teams had good scoring opportunities, but blocked field goals was the order of the day. It was, and you know you had two defenses that were playing lights out, you know, and the offensive uh, football teams on, on each side. Not that they were not playing well, but the the defenses on both sides were. Both sides were just playing that good. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, Coach, uh, uh, as you look at it, five first downs uh, that we gained, they had seven. Uh, they had 107 yards rushing. We had only 41. Uh, they seem to have the edge offensively, Coach, but uh, one thing that has happened in the last three ball games, and that's Giovanni Francis has been able to flip the football field, and he's done it consistently the last three weeks. He has, and, and you know, uh, congratulations to him. He's the uh, conference special teams player of the week, uh, and I think he deserves it, you know, because he has done his job, and that's all we ask him to do is uh, flip the field, you know, change the field position, help us win the field position battle. Three of his punts were fumbled, and we recovered one of them, which led to our first touchdown. Uh, but nonetheless, he has finally begun to understand the weapon that he can be on the football field. And as a result, it gives our defense tremendous confidence, doesn't it? It does. It does. He, he is now starting to figure out, you know, that he is a huge part of what's going on, you know, on this football team and that, that he has a role where everyone is really counting on him mm -hmm. to, to set our defense up in, in good field position. And he's doing just that. Defensively, Coach, we were able to hold them in check uh, with the exception of Chauncey Caldwell, their quarterback who led the team in rushing. And Chauncey Caldwell is a run first, pass second quarterback. We knew that he was going to run that quarterback sweep on us, and he did it effectively. But you were able to hold everyone else in that backfield in check. Isaiah Totten, the other leading rusher, five carries for maybe 40, 45 yards on the day. Uh, when you went into the locker room at the half, what was the discussion defensively? It, it was really uh, just to try to figure out how to get another guy down in the box and, and, and defend the quarterback sweep and the quarterback power because mm -hmm. those were the two plays that were giving us trouble. Uh, and we, we just had to take a guy to the middle of the field and, and give us another overhand guy to, to help us uh, defend that, that play. Offensively, what did we need to do differently? Well, really just make sure everyone was focusing on their jobs. You know, we, we had a lot of opportunities to score in that football game, but we had three penalties that, that took us out of great field position. And, and we had two guys bust routes that, uh, you know, didn't turn up to be positive for us. Yeah. So I, I think the message in the offensive uh, huddle or in, in the offensive locker room at halftime was just everybody settle down and let's do our jobs. We had three drop passes from characters who normally don't drop passes. and we, That could have been attributed to the weather. Uh, nonetheless, we uh, were in great shape going into the locker room, 0-0 zero, zero, with opportunities and with chances to exploit some weaknesses that we did see out there. In the second half, we came back and immediately began to, to really exert uh, some pressure there offensively, and the defensive unit turned up the pressure a couple of notches. Let's take a look at what happens when we come back. On the road, from the MEAC SWAC Challenge to the Celebration Bowl, everyone is competing from start to finish. A MEAC championship is not only on the line, but so is a trip to the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Each game will count from the first to the last. With dominating offenses and powerful defenses, we leave it all on the field. And at the end of the road, only one team will be standing as the MEAC football champion. And we'll see you in Atlanta on December 16th. The biggest rivalry in HBCU sports is back on Saturday, November 18th. 
the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats and Florida A&M Rattlers return to the Camping World Stadium in Orlando for the Florida Blue Florida Classic. Be there for the 38th annual showdown, including the highly anticipated battle of the bands between the world-famous Marching Wildcats and Marching 100. Proceeds benefit scholarship programs at BCU and FAMU. Tickets are as low as $20. Get your tickets today at floridaclassic.org. In the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, success for our student athletes isn't just measured by wins and losses, points on the scoreboard, or individual stats. It's also measured by their performance in the classroom, in the community, and ultimately graduation. Our student athletes aren't just playing to win a single game, they're playing to win at life. Because games end, but life keeps on going. The MIAC, educating student athletes for the game of life. Welcome back to the Wildcat Football Insider. I'm Lynn Thompson. Terry Sims, the head football coach, is with us as we talk about the 13-10 win in Durham, North Carolina over the North Carolina Central Eagles. The Wildcats are now 5-2 and two in MEAC Conference play and a, a, a week to get ready for the Florida NM Rattlers in the Florida Blue, Florida Classic and a chance to finish the season at 6-2 and two overall in conference play. And Coach, uh, we talked uh, the last break about what happened in the locker room and uh, you, you wanted to turn up the notch, a notch or two, the heat and the intensity on the defensive side of the ball, but you wanted to also take advantage offensively on some things that you left on the field. Uh, one of the things that did happen at the end of the first half was that Larry Brim uh, was flushed out of the pocket on the last drive of the first half and hit his head on the sideline and thus was pulled out of the game for the last series of downs when he had the team really rolling. Uh, he eventually returned to the football game, but the, the referees ruled him out of play, and so he had to go through and get checked out. Right. And as a result, Archivius comes in the game. Now you got to change a, to a certain degree what you're going to call, and the result is that we end up with a block field goal. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we had Larry rolling. Larry had us rolling. Um, anytime... You know, a player these days, you, if you hit your head, it's concussion protocol. Yeah. So they had to take him in and check him out. And, you know, he ended up being okay, but we had to insert uh, Akivas at, at that point in time. And he drove us down the field, but the, the drive stalled. Yeah. And we ended up having to uh, take Uriel out and, 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 you know, let him go out and kick the field goal. But we had a, a new guy because we had um, – uh, Demetrius Weaver was not able to make the trip with us. He had a funeral that he had to go to. His father had passed, so uh, we had a new guy in on our field goal unit, and we just had a, a lax in protection, and, you know, we, we, they had a guy that came free to block the field goal. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, but now when we come out the second half, Coach, we establish some rhythm, and uh, when we move down the field, Coach, then uh, Giovanni Francis with a great punt, uh, results in a fumble recovery, and we get rolling. Mike Jones up the gut for 25 yards. Now we're inside the red zone. We get down inside pay dirt. We stall just a little bit, and we come up with a very unique formation inside the four-yard line on a fourth down call, and Archivius runs the ball in. He does, and, and you know, I, I, I can't say the name of it because hopefully we, we'll get to use it again soon, but... Uh... You know, it's, it's something we've been, you know, trying to use all year, and we, we thought we were going to get to use it in a couple of games early, but we didn't. And uh, Akivas just ended up making a great read on the play and keeping the ball. He didn't give it, and he got in the end zone. We scored coaching at that point in time. We figured seven points might be enough to win. And, uh, and though our defense is fired up, we, uh, we hold them to a field goal, and they got fired up. So it's 7-3. And it goes down now to the last four minutes of the football game. And, Coach, we figure that we've got them stopped. And we're going to take possession of the football. And there are two calls in the football game that simply did not go our way. One of them was an interference call. And the other one was an interception that resulted in, uh, in it being called back due to a what, uh, roughing the passer call. Well... Yeah, that was that was one. It, it was called. It was you know roughing the passer was called. Uh, we're still reviewing that to, to see. You know, it, it was a costly penalty. Uh, you know, because Kennedy and Duque he actually uh, intercepted the ball, and that would have given us the ball in great field position. You know, to, to to finish that out. But when when you look at the interference call against Elliott Miller, it was just you know him 
taking his eyes off his guy and, and, and you know, trying to take a sneak peek at the quarterback, and he lost the guy for a second, and he reached for him, and that's when the interference happened. So they get the ball first and 10. They drive down, coach, inside the red zone. It results to a fourth down call, fourth and four. Uh, two tremendous plays. Uh, quarterback flushed out to the right side. Uh, in the grass, going down, makes a tremendous pass. Tremendous catch in the right corner of the end zone on fourth down. He, he does. And, you know, again, it was, it was the same side of the field, same corner, same receiver. Uh, you know, and if you really watch the play, Delwan Beard is a half a step from, you know, sacking the guy. He actually had him in his, in his hands, but he couldn't get him to the ground. You know, it was a big quarterback. He, he's, a, he's a big guy, and it, it took us a while to get him on the ground, and he just made a great play. Uh, and, and their receiver, he got open. He did what he was supposed to do. He got open and, and caught the football and uh, scored the touchdown for them, and the, the touchdown that they thought was the game-winning touchdown. But the call you made? Uh, elected to take the penalty on the kickoff two plays later the Hail Mary and here we are celebrating we'll come back in just a few moments we'll talk about this week's football game we'll go around the league and we'll wrap things up back in just a few on the road from the Miak Swag Challenge to the Celebration Bowl everyone is competing from start to finish a Miak Championship is not only on the line but so is a trip to the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium each game will count from the first to the last. With dominating offenses and powerful defenses, we leave it all on the field. And at the end of the road, only one team will be standing as the MEAC football champion. And we'll see you in Atlanta on December 16th. The biggest rivalry in HBCU sports is back on Saturday, November 18th. The Bethune-Cookman Wildcats and Florida A&M Rattlers return to the Camping World Stadium in Orlando for the Florida Blue Florida Classic. Be there for the 38th annual showdown, including the highly anticipated Battle of the Bands between the world-famous Marching Wildcats and Marching 100. Proceeds benefit scholarship programs at BCU and FAMU. Tickets are as low as $20. Get your tickets today at floridaclassic.org. In the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, success for our student-athletes isn't just measured by wins and losses, points on the scoreboard, or individual stats. It's also measured by their performance in the classroom, in the community, and ultimately graduation. Our student athletes aren't just playing to win a single game, they're playing to win at life. Because games end, but life keeps on going. The MIAC, educating student athletes for the game of life. The DNA of Bethune-Cookman comes from the heart of a great woman whose legacy lives on today in each and every Wildcat. I leave you love. I leave you hope. I leave you a thirst for education. I leave you faith. I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. Great leaders always leave something for others to follow. What will you leave us? Thanks for coming back with us here on the Wildcat Football Insider. For those of you who've been following us, the entire season. I'm Lynn Thompson along with Terry Sims. We certainly enjoy coming into your homes and giving you the ins and outs of BCU Wildcat football. We're talking about the 13-10 Hail Mary win in North Carolina over the Eagles of North Carolina Central University. The Cats are 5-2 and two overall coaching conference play. This assures you of uh, your second out of three uh, winning seasons here at, at the helm of the Wildcat football program coaching and, and, and it's been a pleasure having you here leading this program and now we got a chance this week to finish up in grand style you know one of the things that we've seen uh, with your leadership we've managed to really get this thing rolling in the latter part of the season uh, but folks really don't understand this has been an arduous schedule <laughs> uh, this is uh, you know even the experts have said we, we've probably got the toughest schedule in the league yeah, it, it has, and you know, we, we go from playing the University of Miami to having Hurricane and, and being in Louisiana for, for four or five days and, you know, being displaced 11 total days and going to play FAU, uh, then coming into our conference schedule, yeah. so. Losing, losing off of a controversial call at Howard, probably yeah. if we have instant replay. Right, it's uh, overturned. Right, overturn. uh, losing uh, in heartbreaking fashion uh, at A&T, uh, leading them up until late in the football game. And, and now we're on a roll, Coach. But uh, as, you, as you look around the league, uh, 
uh, you said it time in and time out, uh, th th there's parity in this league and proof is in the pudding here. Coach, Howard University uh, scores two touchdowns in, in the less than two minutes to, to eke out a win at Norfolk State, 28-24. Uh, Hampton, seemingly uh, on a roll, unbeaten in conference play, comes to us. We give them their first loss, and the wheels seem to fall off now. And they go to South Carolina State and are beating, beaten convincingly by down South Carolina State football team, 33-15 in Orangeburg. Delaware State, uh, which most people felt would be an easy win for Morgan State, uh, comes back in grand style, 33-30 over Morgan State. And Savannah State, uh, in a surprisingly much tougher football game than people predicted, uh, gives undefeated North Carolina a and a real good challenge before falling 36-17. And, you know, the, the scores, you know, say it for itself, but if you look, watch all these football games, there are no blowouts. Yeah. You know, everyone is playing a, a great brand of football. You have a lot of good coaches in this league and, and a lot of great players, and I think you're going to continue to have those kind of games in this league for years to come. Okay, now, a minute and a half left in the show. Let's turn our attention to FAMU. Mm -hmm. Everybody's been asking all year long about FAMU. Now we can talk about them. Uh, Alex Woods football team has had a week off to prepare for us. Last year, you had the same benefit. Is it indeed a benefit to take a week off to prepare for your arch rival in a season ending football game? It's a two headed monster. And, and, and when, you, when you look at it, you can, you can use a week off to get guys healthy. To, to try and, and, and you know, get some more individual work, some, some more stuff to kind of hone guys in on their fundamentals. But you can also lose your, your momentum in, in the off week if you don't watch it. So, you know, I, we thought it was beneficial for us last year because we didn't change anything. And, and our guys didn't know what a day off was. They got that Saturday off uh, that they would normally play, but we didn't change anything and I think you know, that's what worked for us, and that's how we have to attack it. I don't know what they did, uh, hopefully not much, and we, uh, hopefully that, that, you know, we, we're preparing ourselves this week, and they come in, and, you know, we, we make it a great football game on set. Well, for those of you who are coming, it's going to be a 205 kickoff in Camping World Stadium, uh, live on ESPN Classic. For those of you who want to join us Thursday night, it's at the 90 Degree Sports Grill, the Terry Sims Show. Uh, if you can't, Watch it on TV, log on to the Cat Eye Radio Network to catch the call from Nolan Alexander and Larry Wesley. Hey, it's been a wonderful ride all year long. We thank you, fans, for following the Wildcats. We're out of time here. For Terry Sims and the Wildcat Nation, I'm Lynn Thompson. We'll see you at the Florida Blue, Florida Classic.